We're going to jump over here. We're starting to get more into RFA and some of the, the algorithms and approaches that we use in RFA. Um, some of these are actually used in all the programs from Raft, Best Foot, um, Total Risk. But <clears throat> the idea is, again, we want to look at uh, several of these uh, sampling approaches from bootstrapping, again, Monte Carlo, and we're going to talk about importance in stratified sampling. So, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the stochastic simulation frameworks um, and how we develop stage frequency. Uh, we want to talk a little bit more and define natural variability and uh, knowledge uncertainty. Hopefully, that we'll get those down. Um, and then we're going to quantify uncertainty using uh, methods like bootstrapping. And then, uh, we'll, of course, we'll go into a little bit more about what importance in stratified sampling is, and we'll look at the stochastic approach we're doing in um, RFA kind of step through that process. All right. So first, we're going to go through the stochastic simulation framework. So this is currently boiled down into two basic approaches. We have, um, first, we have like the foundation of developing like a stage frequency loading curve. So there's two basic approaches. There's precip and there's volume. So for precip-based approach, we have to sample precip. We gotta have precip frequency curve. We're gonna sample that precip from the precipitation from that frequency curve. We're gonna scale it using storm shapes from wherever you got it from. We got a ideograph of, um, that has a spatial and temporal pattern. We're gonna scale those. Um, then we're gonna distribute that over our rainfall runoff model. So typically for most of us, it's HMS. You can use some other things. Um, and from there, we're gonna get our results. We're gonna get our info hydrographs uh, using that information routed to the reservoir, um, we'll get a stage, and we do that, of course, many times over, and you can get a stage frequency curve. Um, given our base approach is precipitation. So the other way is, of course, um, inflow volume. So this is a little bit simpler, but Basically, you have you sample inflow volume from a volume frequency analysis. So again, that's our best fit. We go through best fit and create a volume frequency analysis, put it into our face. So we're going to sample that volume frequency. We're going to scale those inflow hydrographs according to what we're telling it to scale it to. And then we're going to route that again through the reservoir many times over. And that gives us stage frequency of uncertainty. So this right here is our basic framework for RFA. And so this process is a little simpler than the precip-based approach, and, and it has the advantage of knowing more information about the volume frequency. So the volume frequency for a precip frequency approach only really knows what you know um, from the precipitation frequency itself. So whereas the volume frequency um, can use a lot more information, precip, your volumes, um, it, it uses your inflow hydrograph shapes. It, it, it can, it, you can actually incorporate a lot more um, quickly with the volume frequency approach. So, like we've been talking about um, with uncertainty, there's two primary components of randomness and flood exceedance probabilities. There's our natural variability and our knowledge uncertainty. So natural variability or aleatory uncertainty, and, you know, it refers to observed differences in our population. So Sources of a natural variability uh, are the result of natural random um, processes. So the flood occurs randomly in a way that cannot be fully predicted. So this is natural. We'll go, we'll keep explaining a little bit more of this as we go. So knowledge uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty refers to the lack of knowledge about a specific factor and about a parameters or about a models. Um, its source includes, you know, our sources include parameter uncertainty our model uncertainty, scenario uncertainty, things like that. So natural variability is best described as the effect of randomness and is a function of the system. Uh, so it's not reducible. So you can't really reduce natural variability with study or further measurement. Whereas knowledge uncertainty is a lack of knowledge about something like a parameter that characterizes a system. So knowledge uncertainty can be reduced through more measure or more study. So we separate the two uncertainties so that we can kind of quantify 
knowledge uncertainty and determine the best way to scope more advanced studies. So if you can clearly state which one's what you have, then you can scope to, to reduce the one of the, the knowledge uncertainty. So it just like natural variability against like natural processes, kind of like your weather, um, whether it's sunny or dry, you can like this hill on here, one part of it's dry and one part of it's raining. It's just the natural variability of, of weather and um, in our flows, like if our, again, our flows, any, the range of what your flow actually comes in is, a, is just a natural variability of that. So um, knowledge uncertainty is more really about what you know about the model, um, the, the, the parameters, the, you know, how accurate it is, how complex it is. Is it, is it accounting enough for big events or any events? Um, it's just the knowledge you have that goes into that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a frequency curve in itself is modeled as a natural variability. So for us, again, our predictive mode curve that represents our LP3 distribution of our most likely, that's our natural variability. So natural variability can be, you know, kind of visualized as a range of the flood magnitudes over a given range of AEPs. So that, on this case, is that blue one. So it represents a range in flow over a, a range of AEPs. That's the natural variability. So if you think of a flatter, if this blue curve was flat, you would have a pretty small range in flow over your range in AEPs. So you wouldn't have very much natural variability. Whereas if it's more steep like this, the range in flow in the Y can be much more varied over those same AEPs. So you might have a wider range in natural variability, but that's just reflecting that one curve. So the, the range of flow from here to here is your natural variability given those AEPs on the x-axis. So that's not the, the credible animals, it's just that one curve and its flow difference from across the AEPs and the, that's the natural variability. That's our mode. That's our LP3. So credible intervals represent, of course, our knowledge uncertainty. So when a flood does occur, the size of the flood is not exactly known. So if we were to take a vertical slice across the intervals, again here, um, <clears throat> we would see that the knowledge uncertainty has a distribution. So it has some kind of distribution across that right there. So the knowledge uncertainty is a form of sampling error, and sampling error is a form of record length. So in a flow volume or stage frequency analysis, the longer the record, the less sample error we have, so that decreases our knowledge uncertainty. And just, you know, if you had perfect knowledge, you would have all the samples of the entire population, you would know exactly what it is. So the more knowledge that we have, more samples we have, the less sampling error. Sampling error is the difference between our sample and the population, the, the final. So just, we're gonna briefly cover this. Um, effective record length is, of course, one of the variables we use right now um, as we bring in input into volume frequency analysis into RFA. Um, so <clears throat> it's something we cover a little more in the first course in 114, we go in a little more description and, and go through the calculations and the processes, but I just wanted to cover it again here just for familiarity. So ERL is used, you know, for stochastic flood hydrology and risk assessments to, to measure uncertainty of the volume frequency analysis. So ERL itself is not the measure of the number of years or, or the period of record. That's just your record link. So ERL is not your record link. URL is more of the knowledge you have in your period of record. So if you have only systematic or historical data, you would expect your effective record length to be no longer than your record length or short, it would be shorter. If you have regional data, then that regional data can extend your effective record length to longer than your data that you have, the systematic. So effective record length is more about the knowledge that goes into what you have. So... <clears throat> Let's see what happened. So in best fit, you might have an input data that looks like this. So the record length here is somewhere around, it's around 70 years in this period. Um, but you have a really long perception threshold over here. So the effective data for this is around 160 years. 
So we could also represent the same data set like this with the actual 160 years of systematic data. So it turns out the two of these actually have the exact same LP3 posterior mode. So the same amount of certainty is with both um, the same amount, you have the same posterior predicted curve. So the effective record length of the two are the same. You end up with the same LP3, same uncertainty, even though one is perception threshold and one's all a bunch of systematic data. So, but essentially what you're doing with these long perception thresholds, even though this is a longer period, once you calculate the effective record length, it can be equivalent to a, a systematic record. So I don't know. So it's just two different concepts there. All right. Let's run through like what that actually means. Um, reducing knowledge uncertainty in, in, in word in terms of ERL. So here we've got our same example down that we've been using in our, in our workshops. Um, except with this, we have a frequency curve that's based on 30 years of data. Um, effective record length of 30 years of data. Again, black curve is our natural variability. And just ho hopefully it sticks. So the natural variability here is around um, 300,000 to roughly 8,000, 6,000. So the y-axis is our magnitude over a course of A, B. So just the black curve is our natural variability. And then, of course, the distribution of that through our, is our knowledge uncertainty. Anyway, the point is, this is, has a wide uncertainty given our 30 years of ERL. Um, if we reduce that down, if we increase the effective record length to 100 years, so we have more knowledge about it, it, the mode itself doesn't change at all. But because we have longer effective re record length representing, that just basically represents our, we have a reduced knowledge uncertainty. The credible intervals um, reduce quite a bit. And then we do it one more time to 300 years. So maybe you have paleo data now, both precip, and you've got a lot longer effective record length. It reduces even more. Each time the natural variability is not changing, just the knowledge uncertainty based on our, and that effective record length is just a, a value that represents that. Um, so if, anyway, it's, all right. Got a little bit of effective record length. We're gonna use that later on in RFA. So let's get back to describing or how we actually quantify the natural variability and knowledge uncertainty. So we have, Basically, two methods. We have Bootstrap and we have Monte Carlo. That is our two primary um, methods that we're going to be talking about here. So, remember, Monte Carlo is a technique for drawing random samples from a probability distribution. So, we use Monte Carlo when we want unbiased samples uh, from a distribution to reflect the knowledge and certainty that we have. So, the, the unbiased samples, of course, reflect the sampling error that we have in our sampled. Um, LP3 curves compared to our final population. In RFA, we use uh, Naive Monte Carlo um, both in a inner loop and an outer loop. So the outer loop in Monte Carlo is part of the bootstrapping sample process, which creates the random flow samples, so our bootstrap samples, of size n, where n is equal to our ER ERL. So that's where really our ERL is playing a big role, is it's telling us how many samples that we're gonna sample using Monte Carlo. So we create a bootstrap sample. So if you only sample 30, so if you think in an in a LP3, like if you're plotting LP3, if you only have 30 samples, you get a really wide range of what possible, uh, possible LP3s. If you put, if you had 100 systematic record or 100 samples, there's a, you have a tighter range of LP3. So given it that URL, bootstrap is gonna know how many samples to sample. So that's where the URL is coming into. The, so, and that's in the outer loop bootstrap Monte Carlo, outer loop Monte Carlo process for RFA. The, the inner loop, the second time Monte Carlo is used is, um, you know, for the inner loop. So the Monte Carlo process in the inner loop, again, is sampling the input parameters um, that you put into RFA. That's your inflow hydrographs, your starting stage duration, your flood seasonality. Those are your natural variability. So the outer loop is our knowledge and certainty around our knowledge and certainty around the natural variability of the curve. Our inner loop is sampling our inflow hydrographs, uh, starting stage, flood seasonality. Those are our natural variability. 
just this is just kind of the generating the sample process and kind of where this comes from, the, where the Monte Carlo kind of comes from. So the foundation concept of Monte Carlo is inverse transfer met, transform method. So this concept of inverse of the cumulative distribution function, it's central to, the, to generating the random samples for each input distribution of the Monte Carlo. So in other words, the values of X given the value of the cumulative probability. So to generate a random sample for the probability distribution, a random number um, U is generated from a uniform distribution from zero to one. So somewhere down here, we're gonna generate a random number from zero to one. So, and to provide it, so that provides an equal opportunity of X value being generated from the, the processor range, the, uh, the, the uh, percentile range here. So. This value of u is then entered into the inverse function to determine the value to be generated from a distribution. So given that random sample, we're gonna come up here and look at that, that cumulative distribution function. So for Monte Carlo with a normal distribution, we're simply transforming a uniform random number of u uh, from a, a zero to one <clears throat> to a bell curve. And so for Monte Carlo, with this complex model, uh, we're basically treating the inputs as random variables, running them through thousands of iterations, and then post-processing that, interpreting the outputs. So we're basically just going from a random sample who committed a distribution into a, the PDF here. And, and that's basically going to give us ability, ability to create uh, random samples from a uniform distribution. And that gives us our... But, how many of those we do is, is our ERL number. So, all right, and RFA and, and RAFT, the, the rainfall runoff frequency tool, we're using bootstrap, bootstrapping is, is the really what's doing, it's the, it's really doing the work. It's the boot, um, the, <laughs> it's the hard work. Anyway, it's, bootstrapping is a type of resampling method. So it's a technique for estimating quantiles about a population by averaging estimates from multiple small data samples. So bootstrapping assigns measures of accuracy to sampling estimates. And so this technique allows estimation of the sampling distribution of almost any statistics used in random sampling methods. So when bootstrap is sampled many times over, like the 10,000 we do in RFA, um, then things like the confidence bounds can be in the expected curve. So basically after doing, a, we'll go through this, after doing, we'll go through this more in parts. After doing each individual bootstrap sample, those are each fit a new curve. You do that 10,000 times, you get 10,000 of these LP3, which basically ends up representing that uncertainty bound. So there's a lot kind of going on here with RFA when it comes to how the stochastic model is running. So even uh, with Monte Carlo and the bootstrap method, um, there's still some areas of this process that can be kind of in, in, insufficient, um, inefficient. So, so before we get a little bit further along, let's talk about stratified and important sampling. So with a standard Monte Carlo sampling, computation would be really inefficient for what we need it to be. The bulk of the, comp the computations uh, would be spent in, on exceedance probabilities that we're really not interested in. So when you're using Monte Carlo and you're sampling 10,000 events, if, if, you're, um, if you look at a distribution, only about 1,000 of those 10,000 distributions would be actually sampling from beyond a 10-year. So the other 9,000 would sample within the first 10 years if you just did typical Monte Carlo. And so if you really wanted enough samples in the upper end of the curve, if you're just using regular Monte Carlo, you would have to run hundreds and hundreds of thousands to get enough events to define the upper end of the curve because of the way it uniformly distributes. That's where stratified sampling comes in. So stratified, so stratified importance, so we'll break down each. So stratified is a way of dividing, dividing your population into smaller groups. So it's a, it's a method of, so that means like in RFA, um, we can divide the volume frequency curve that we just, that we just estimated in the outer curve. We can divide that, um, into different segments. So RFA by default divides a, an LP3 curve into 200 segments, bins, 
And then in each bin, it does 50 events. So it's going to sample 50 events from the 200 bins. So stratification is basically a way of taking our volume frequency curve and breaking it into parts. So if it's uniform, most of those bins are going to be all over here on the left side of the very frequent side of your volume frequency curve. And there's not going to have very many in the upper end, but it's going to be bin. So that's where, let's see what, so that's where we also have importance. So the importance part of this is what we use is um, extreme value type one. So instead of being a uniformly um, distributed in log space, um, we're going to we're going to distribute it in with the extreme value type one. <clears throat> so let's see if that has it. So what we're talking about here is instead of a, in a uniform distribution, all these bins would be mostly down here in log space with a, a bin, oh, just one or two bins up here. If you do it with a stream value type one, um, it breaks it uniformly in log space. And what that means is that each bin has equal weight um, all the way up in, in log space. And so what that allows us to do and is be able to make have a lot more samples. So with only 10,000 samples, we can sample from the upper end of the curve evenly as we do in the lower end of the curve. Um, and if you convert that over uh, into our Z variant kind of space that we normally look at it, you actually end up with more samples in our upper end of the curve than we do in the lower end where we don't really care. So stratified and important sampling is taking a way where just basic Monte Carlo would look at 9,000 events down here in this area of the curve, uh, but it, in, and then it would only have like a thousand events for the rest because of the way it uniformly distributes. But moving to it, uh, EV, EV1, it allows us to evenly distribute all these bins, the stratification, evenly across log space, and then we convert that over to Z variant. That means we're actually sampling most of our samples in the area of the curve where we're of interest in the upper end of the curve. So that allows us to be able to only use, we can use a lot less um, iterations or samples like we do in RFA, like we're only using 10,000 to basically define a full curve. So I don't know if that helps, but that's basically what the breakdown of bootstrap and of with using um, stratified importance is doing for us. So. Let's kind of see if we can walk through that a couple of different ways. So let's look at RFA. Let's go through the outer loop, uh, look at the volume frequency curve. So using Monte Carlo, RFA will, so it's going to generate um, in size uh, samples from our user defined ERL. Um, so this is our, again, our bootstrap samples. So that uses uh, user defined LP3 parameters that we usually tell it and given the ERA. So N, N again is, B, B, N is based on our ERL. So the bootstrap will then, once you have its samples, the bootstrap will then estimate a uh, new LP3 parameter set. <coughs> and so that's our bootstrap distribution. So now given that parameter, new LP3 parameter, the new inflow curve is developed. And, we're going to process, we're going to repeat that 10,000 times. And so each LP3 outer loop is a realization. So just to close the kind of hopefully the picture on this, um, let's see how this actually works this evening. So I don't know if this helps. So this is what Nathan's asking. Um, when you create a new sample, bootstrap sample, that's like these red dots. And once you have those red dots, then you can calculate a new LP3 curve given those new, new curve. That's our outer loop. So our inner loop is then going to stratify and sample that new curve so that we have 200 bins and 50, 50 samples per bin. And we're going to, that's 10,000. And we're going to take each one of those and route those through as an inner loop sampling our inflow hydrograph uh, starting stage flood, flood seasonality so we can route that particular sample off of this new curve through our reservoir and get a new stage. We do that 10,000 times on the inner loop. So sampling this thing, this one curve 10,000 times, now we have a, 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 a stage 
loading curve from that one example. And so then we could do this 10,000 times and you get a full uncertainty. But you have the choice. So um, if we, we when we, we have the choice in RFA when we do full uncertainty to do um, 100 of these red curves, red dots and red curves, and then or up to 10,000 of those. For every one of these red curves we produce, it always does 10,000 inner loop um, uh, samples. So for every one of these curves, it's going to break it into 10,000 samples. So the 200 bins times 50, for every one of those samples, we're going to route it through the reservoir, giving our a new inflow hydrograph starting stage um, for that pool and route it through the reservoir. So for the expected curve only, we're doing this once and routing it 10,000 times. So for a rough estimate expected curve. For the full uncertainty, we can do this 100 to 10,000 times. Every one of those realizations is a red curve. We will also internally in the inner loop do it 10,000 um, routes through the routing, routings through the reservoir. So yeah, you can, well, I think I say it at some point, you can have 10,000 times 10,000, so 100 million events routed through RFA for the full uncertainty. So just stepping this through, we're gonna look at like this example, it has 50 uh, as an ERL. So you've sampled this instance, there's 50 samples here. You got a new LP3 curve, it's down here. Okay, so you do another sample. So this is another outer loop, some more, a different type of sampling. Again, these are all based on that uniform zero to one Monte Carlo sample off of that. It creates the 50 of these because you gave it a 50 URL, fits a new LP3 curve. So that's your outer loop, your uh, single uh, realization. So this is just another realization. So there's three realizations. Four, you do it enough times, you can end up with 10,000 realizations. That represents the uncertainty that we, that we understood in best fit. We had an understanding of the volume frequency uncertainty. We pulled over the, the posterior mode, the LP3 with the ERL. If you do this enough times, you basically can re-represent re that in the stage frequency process. So you end up with that same uncertainty. So we'll go through this real quick. So again, the outer loop is a Monte Carlo process using uh, methods and moments the for the samples and the bootstrapping process. It's all about producing those individual samples given our ERL and, and then re recalculating the LP3 so that we have a, a, a realization, it's called a realization RFA. So we have a new LP3 curve to stratify an important sample. So in the inner loop, now we take that LP3 curve we created, we use an importance and stratified sampling so that we have 10,000 events to sample from. We're gonna use Monte Carlo to sample our inflow one of our inflow hydrographs and our basically our starting stage pool. So that's the starting stage and flood seasonality so we can get a new starting pool. And then given that particular inflow sample, inflow volume frequency curve and the starting stage that we came up with, we route that through the reservoir. We'll do that 10,000 times on the inner loop. So the outer loop, you have the choice to do it once with the expected only or up to 10,000 times with the full uncertainty. The inner loop, for every time you run a realization, we always done 10,000 samples. So real quick, we'll walk through that. So the process is step one. Oh, sorry. Step one, get our bootstrap samples and a new LP3. So that's our outer loop, our realization. Step two is um, we're going to stratify an important sample. So we basically are going to grab a, a new point and find that flow. That's our flow that we're going to be scaling our inflow hydrograph to. That's our sample, which is the next step three. We're going to scale our hydrograph shape given the inflow that we bootstrapped. So our Monte Carlo inner loop is going to grab a new inflow. Whatever inflow we get, we're going to scale it to that original uh, inflow we sampled so that this, whatever volume this is equals the volume that we we're shooting for. Um, got to sample the, the, the starting stage and seasonality, flood seasonality. So our flood seasonality and our starting stage 
that we have a new starting pool for our new, our particular run we're going to do, given. And then, of course, um, step five, we're going to route that through the reservoir. So given our, now our, um, we're, all of our other inputs from our Monte Carlo, in, in, so input, uh, we route that through the reservoir. And of course, step six is once you've done that enough times, um, using the total probability theorem, we can calculate our final stage frequency with uncertainty. Um, but just kind of the important, some of the important things to remember through this um, is that the outer loop, which is your, takes into account from your, say your volume frequency analysis, your LP3, which is your natural variability of flow, and you give it an ERL, which represents your uncertainty. So the outer loop is basically gonna be sampling from that uncertainty and creating a new volume frequency curve, an LP3 curve um, for every realization. And then given that outer loop LP3 curve, we're gonna go to the inner loop. We're gonna stratify important sample it so we can, we can very efficiently sample 10,000 events for the full, um, uh, up from upper to lower curve and route each individual through the reservoir given an inner loop Monte Carlo, which is basically sampling our, which inflow hydrograph you're gonna use and what basically the starting stages you're gonna to use to route through. And so, like I said, you have the, uh, in RFA, we can do one realization, which is our expected curve, or you can do uh, 100 to 10,000, which builds the full uncertainty. Okay. Um, let me just, so we kind of covered the, some of the st stochastic frameworks. There's the precept base, but you can get a stage frequency curve with precept base. If you just don't have the knowledge of the volume, like um, USGS gauge data, you don't have volume um, in, with that. Uh, but you can get a stage frequency with just precept. But most of the time we try to use a volume frequency so we can incorporate precept and volume total into the package. So we talked about natural variability and uncertainty, knowledge uncertainty. Hope you have an idea of what those two are. Um, and then we kind of walk through bootstrapping.